As rolling blackouts continue to grip the nation, the country is confronted by a soaring cost of living crisis and an unprecedented, an unprecedented number of social scourges run rampage in South Africa. A new deluge of political options confronts the voter in 2024. But is more choice always better? Or are these new options merely confusing voters further? Or do they represent something genuinely new on the South African political landscape? That's our conversation for tonight. I'm your host, Sizwe Mpofu Walsh. Our guests are Songhe Zozibi from Rise and Zanzi, Nobuntu Klauso Webster from Build One South Africa, and Chilubas Bongani Baloi. Do remember to engage with this topic on Twitter using our handle at unfiltered SABC. But first, for some context, let's watch this insert produced by Jackie Mapala. We have registered with the IEC and we've registered to contest the national election and also all nine provinces. Active citizenry in defense of democracy or a scramble for power by any means necessary or even the refusal to be led by some of those who form splinter parties after leadership squabbles with their former parties. People ask me, why are you coming back? I'm saying I'm here for more. I think it was Arnold Schwarzenegger who said, I'll be back. It's almost 12 months before the May 2024 general elections and South Africans continue to look for answers to the depressing state of the nation. More and more political parties and civil society actors raise their hands, promising to change the country's fortunes from lack of service delivery, high unemployment, high crime levels, endless corruption, a motionless economy and an incapable state. The goal? To dislodge the once dominant African National Congress from the levers of power associated with multiple governance failures and to shift political power from the dominant parties who have so far failed to convince the country's racially and socially economically diverse population. Aware that South Africans have lost faith in the party political system, some initially introduce themselves as civil society movements, then suddenly morph into political parties vying for votes, leaving voters confused. But if the common goal is to fight corruption and change South Africa's political and economic fortunes, why are they not uniting under the same banner in the interest of the country? And how are the already apathetic voters supposed to make choices that have an impact in changing their lives with more of their votes being divided? Is this an ego-driven contest for power that threatens to further weaken the opposition vote, subjecting the country to more messy coalitions at national level, or is it simply democracy at work? As more political parties and actors come into the fold at national and local government levels, the pool of political kingmakers grows, promising an even messier political landscape with multiple interests at stake. If the current municipal coalition is anything to go by, and while welcoming the diversity of choices and a maturing electoral democracy, Voters can also not be faulted in asking, who are these people? What is their motive? Who is funding them? And with what intention? Welcome back. So to continue our conversation, Mr. Zibi, your party, Rise Mzansi, has launched too much fanfare. But from the perspective of a voter, this is quite confusing. The number of parties is almost rising to the point of absurdity, is it not? Is this not just a confusion for the average voter in South Africa for 2024? Good evening, Cesar. So there are two segments of voters in South Africa. There are those who vote and those who don't. 30% uh, of them vote, at least in 2021, and 70% of them didn't. The first thing we have to ask is why it is that so many people who are eligible to vote do not vote in South Africa at all. Because if the logic, as the insert appears to suggest, that 
is the fragmentation that is the problem, then you'd still have more people voting. But that landscape being very divided. What is clear is that there is something that the political establishment as we have it is not providing to society. And I think there's something fundamentally wrong even with a political proposition anyway. And that proposition is to say, we're going to center the whole of society on the idea of a political party that is going to solve all the problems for everyone. <clears throat> but the problem with our society right now is not even so much that we've got load shedding and crime and so on. It is a complete disintegration of the very idea of South Africa. But do you, do you not have any sympathy for standing from a voter's perspective and seeing all these different names, all these different messages, when it might be more effective to combine these efforts into one more powerful effort? The question I would ask is under what principles? Uh, I think what you are seeing is the outcome of a situation where politically people are losing faith in the democracy. And that, I guess the question is to ask is whether we, at least we at Rise Mzansi, are not also searching for the same answers that voters are searching for. Because before you become a political party, you are a voter first. And you share the same frustrations that the 70% have got. And you ask yourself, what is the answer to this conundrum that we have? So I think the analysis sometimes begins in the wrong place, but fundamentally is why, why are so many people losing faith in the democracy, including myself as a voter, and therefore what is the answer? The answer might lie in the fact that the political establishment is itself not answering that question because it is formulated and cultured in a particular way that does not resonate with voters. And I think it's an important political and social project to look for an alternative way of doing politics that might resonate with more people. Well, the, the charge is that, and I'll put this to the other guests as well, is that you are unable to be led, each of your parties. You're unable to subsume yourself within a bigger project. And so egos have taken over and each formation with a roughly similar program has decided to go it alone. What do you say to that, that charge? What I say to that is let us assume, Caesar, with a complete utter lack of legitimacy that the ANC suffers from. I and my colleagues would have gone into the ANC. Do you think that would have excited voters back into the ballot to vote for the ANC? The answer is no. Not necessarily ANC, but let's no, say... No, sure. Uh, Any political party. I'm yeah. using the ANC as the Coca-Cola yeah. of South African or even, politics. Or even, even a collaboration of the new entrants, let's say, for example. No, sure. But under what principles? Principles, values, ideology matter. They really do. I think there is something called a moonshot coalition that is being proposed. Let's say we just do that. But that's still a portion of the 30%. Does the fact that you have that combination suddenly make it legitimate when voters already have pronounced <laughs> that they don't want them? Yeah. No, absolutely. Let me let me bring in our other guests and Ms. Lazo. What do you make of this charge that there's confusion, there's there are too many new entrants, and you might have been better served actually coordinating efforts under one platform, even that even if that's a new opposition platform. Thank you, Siswe, for, for having us this evening. Let me start here by saying that when we launched, we launched in September of 2022 as Build One South Africa. And when we launched, there was nothing in the political landscape at that time that was an expression of what we sought to do, which was to do something different um, in a number of ways, because it's very clear that what we have at the moment, the political parties that we have at the moment, even the systems, um, even internally, um, under which they work, is not working for this country. You look around in this country and it's very clear that something is broken and something isn't working. So we were very clear that, first of all, we don't want to go and duplicate whatever's already there. We have to disrupt, and I come from a entrepreneurial business background, so we talk about disruption. So you have to disrupt what's there and start to do something different and start to think differently. One of the things that was critical to us is that, first of all, what we're doing is values-based. We're based on value. Um, it's pragmatic. It speaks to the issues of South Africa, but most importantly, that it takes power back to South Africans. Because we all sat in December, for instance, of 2022, held ransom 
by what will happen, what outcome will come out of the NC Electoral Conference. And what you want to make sure of is that South Africans feel that they have a bit more participation, not just when they vote once in five years, but they have more participation in the electoral system and in the governance of the country. But can I ask you on that? So, yeah. okay, let's assume there was nobody like Bosa before. That doesn't mean that after Bosa's emergence, you couldn't have spoken to new entrants and said, actually, let's, let's do this together. So is that a fair argument when in fact you could still have done what some are proposing even after your emergence? So absolutely, we exist and we're doing something different. Uh, we're doing a model that's different. We're saying to, 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 to communities, you choose your leaders. And so we are open to other political parties that say, let's work together. Values have to be the same, principles have to be the same, and we have to be able to test the collaboration and to test that that's true. So we've never been close to that, even after. So we're the ones um, that have come, we did something different. And so we're open to others who come after and say, they also want to do something different to have conversations and to see if there's a meeting of minds in any kind of way. Don't don't you think everybody is about pragmatism, everybody is about integrity, or at least avowedly everybody is about those kinds of values that you espouse? Absolutely. So those who are, we're open to the discussion. So if that's, if that's what you're about, and we are, we, we've openly said, this is what we're doing, this is what we've presented to the country, and we've said, this is what we're doing. So we're open to those discussions. We've always been clear, right from the outset, that we're open to discussions and to collaborations of, of any sort that takes South Africa forward. At the end of the day, one of the things that we all have to remember is that we have to put South Africa first, we have to put South Africans first, and we always have to come back to what's best for that. One of the things that's non-negotiable for us is that in whatever we're doing, it's values driven, and it always comes back to giving power back to South Africans, because the way it's worked now, it's, it, it's really been stripped. Mr. Baloy, what do you make of the conversation so far and this theme of it's better to go together rather than fragment the opposition in a thousand different directions? Look, I think there's quite frankly a nonsensical argument. In fact, it's born out of a, 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 a deeply held feeling of preserving space for those who currently hold that space. So if our position was united and doing so well, I think that the country would be in a very difficult position and difficult decisions that opposition should have made many years ago would have probably have been made. In fact, what you see is, is actually a re-energization of South African politics by a new crop of leaders that are emerging and that are not doing that are not emerging within the current status quo or set political parties but are doing it outside of and becoming disruptors so naturally when pe when a group of people who then pers pursue a venge and a type of uh, direction it's generally going to upset the status quo who believe it is their space they have become comfortable majority of opposition people who advance that argument are only loyal to their comfort only so anything that seeks to disrupt this comfort becomes a problem and then they fear monger this thing to suggest that we could be better in one or whatever and even if you can look at our value proposition of all three political parties you'll identify the similarities but there's also a specific focus in a specific demographic so so i i actually see that it's easier for us to find each other post the election once we've focused on a specific demographic and come together because this new set of leaders here can easily find each other and in fact we we, we really want to advance the country forward. So I really see that type of reasoning as nonsensical but equally suggesting how big a risk such movements are to the body of politics in South Africa. So, so you say it's nonsensical and I hear the point about the existing opposition mm. but I think the, the question before us is the new entrance. Mm. Is it nonsensical to expect the new entrance to have come under one umbrella or or not, because I think that is the, the real question. Sure, there are other political parties where you do seem to disagree quite sharply, but the offering does seem to be quite similar with the new entrants that are, that are here tonight. I think it's similar in some instances, but very different in areas of focus. And we would argue strongly that our areas of focus specifically is a demographic between the ages of 18 and 45. And that demographic is largely unemployed and unemployable and in majority. And that demographic, if they have parents, a uh, stats essay tells us that their parents is single parent households really, and it's largely black women who suffer the most. So we, we really are focusing on a specific 
demographic, voting demographic, which is the biggest voting demographic, and by by, by also uh, indicating that in these conversations, and I've had the fortune of being part of these conversations or an observer about coalition agreements, and what you find is never an expression about the people. The point of departure all the time is what's, what, what belongs to us, what must we do, which position, what budget, and who do we keep out. And I looked, and I always thought to myself, but who, who really gives a thought about the young people there or an agenda that informs government. So there's always contesting issues of positions and power and budgets and in and, and which government really does not coordinate its, its, its entire effort towards dealing with those. And we are going to come to coalitions because that's something I really want to speak to and I yeah. think you've all spoken about before in interesting mm -hmm. ways. But I guess on this theme, the last thing I'd want to ask is, you say after the election it's better to come together. Yeah. And that gives rise to a suspicion that, I, in fact, this is one, one thing, but it's presented to voters as different options. And then suddenly after the election we'll see a coming together. Wouldn't that be um, a way of confusing voters and, and not being transparent about the intentions, if the ultimate intention is just to come together after the election anyway? Well, the fact that no one will get 50 plus 1 uh, percent of the electoral vote will force people to have conversation, which will also introduce for the first time, at least in our lived reality, uh, in our democratic dispensation, a coalition of national government and some provincial governments. So it's going to force people to talk to each other. So that's something that's inevitable in any case, because we have to have that conversation around government and how we engage with each other and what are the core values that we can agree on and how do we approach this thing called the state be, be beyond just the position and the finances attached to it and, and various other things so i think uh, the situation that will give birth as a consequence of voters speaking uh, because I, I believe that voters will be animated in different uh, segments by these various offerings because they were not there and 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 and, and the, the most exciting thing is how these three different institutions have pursued three different ways of launching themselves as political parties and they're finding expression and following in the market which for me is indicate is an indication that what we're going to see in 2024 is actually going to upset a lot of people and most of the status quo. Well, we're debating and discussing new political entrants, a genuine shakeup of South Africa's political landscape, or just more confusing choice. We'll be back after the break with more of this conversation. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Unfiltered. We're discussing the new entrants in South Africa's political landscape. And we've been debating with Songezo Zibi, leader of Rise Mzansi, Ubuntu Thazo Webster from Build One South Africa, and Chilubas Bongani Baloi. Before we carry on with our conversation, which we're going to move on to questions of party funding and the funding landscape in South Africa, let's take a look at this graphic over here. And what we see is declared donations over uh, a recent period, and we have Action SA uh, with 5 million, the ANC with 32 million, this is the most recent quarter declared uh, to the ICC, uh, the IEC, uh, the DA, the EFF, the Patriotic Alliance, you can also see those numbers. So that gives you a snapshot, at least into the declared funding of these political parties. And uh, I see my guests chuckling as well. I think there's an interesting conversation to be had about declarations versus reality. But Mr. Zibi, uh, who is funding Rise Mzansi? Uh, because I, I guess the question is, is the piper calling the tune or is, is the party calling the tune? Sizwe, you know, there is always an assumption in the public discourse that when somebody de makes a, starts a political initiative or a group of people, do they already have the money. It actually is an enormous sacrifice. People leave their jobs and face the uncertainty of having to use some of their own savings, uh, which especially for black people, you are in a precarious position in different ways in any event, in order to take whatever deeply held political beliefs that you have, develop them and make them a reality and reach out to many people. So is it just so no just no, no I'm, I'm, make, I'm making a point. It's important to challenge the assumption because most of the people involved with our effort, like myself, haven't been paid for a very long time. 
because you want to bring it to fruition. The second thing that's important for viewers to know, it is incredibly difficult to raise funds when you are not one of these guys that we see on the screen. We have a track record, they have MPs, there's a possibility of patronage that people can get, and you can see who, who is getting the most money there. So because, I hear you right, Mr. No, no, I'm coming. I'm coming. No, no, no. I will, I, I will answer it because these are important issues. Right? We can, by omission, misdirect the conversation, and we must not. So that is the second thing. The last thing is that there is an electoral funding act in South Africa. When that time comes, Rise Mzansi will declare who Rise Mzansi's funders are that have brought, basically that are contributing to, to the effort. What we must not do is to weaponize the question, first of all, and also be careful not to use the assumption that whenever somebody starts a political initiative, they are too intellectually dumb to initiate something on their own. And, and I'm and not doing that. No, I know you're not no, doing that. I, let, I am addressing, let me, I'm addressing the question. I'm, I'm, I'm addressing the question because I have a very specific yeah. question. Yeah. It's who's funding Rise Mzansi. We will declare and, that. And I guess you come as a new alternative. Yeah. Your, your proposition is you're doing things differently. Yes. You're coming with new integrity and new transparency. Wouldn't yes. it be different to actually say, we're not going to tell you later but we're going to tell you now, why do South Africans have to wait to learn this important question? Because we are at a critical phase in our development. One of the reasons you see one of the parties with an unrealistic uh, number of declaration is because South Africans are afraid to even contribute to parties like ours. Because if they do, they're going to get victimized in business and in other areas. So it, it is pr pragmatic for us to wait for that three months and then declare because if you do it now every time there's a tv interview for you, you say bongani gave me money the rest of the people are not going to give you any money that three month period is set out in the electoral funding act is appropriate and at the end of that three months we will publish the information through the iec okay um Ms. Lazo, are you at liberty having formed uh last year to be more transparent about your funding right now so what I can tell you is that, um, similar to what um, Mr. Zib is saying, one of the things that people assume is that, you know, you've got, you've got these backers and there's all this money. But in this climate, first of all, economic climate, but also uh, with the legislation that exists, that's not the case. Uh, Build Brand South Africa was started by a group of co-founders who have put their own, their own funds into, into the organization. But likewise, the people who have joined us, who we've worked with, activists on the ground. So some of the activities, many of the activities you'll see us doing, activities, community, community projects, activities on the ground, are funded by activists themselves because they believe in the work that we're doing. They're funded by provincial leaders. They're funded by, region, they're funded by regional leaders. We've also got on our site an option for the public to donate. And we've had quite a lot of donations from South Africans. It ranges from 50 rand to, you know, um, anything above that. And, and, and so, this, is, this is all well and good, but yeah. to contest an election, you need to compete with mm. even the declared amounts of the ANC. You need 32 million rand a quarter, maybe a hundred, maybe a billion. So, I mean, I think South Africans know that you need some rich people to help you. People with money are going to donate. Yeah. And so I guess the question is just why not just say who the people are. Maybe South Africans would be more uh, willing to, you know, accept it if if it was a bit more. Let me open. let me tell you why. Because we want South Africans to contribute and invest as much as anybody else who might have a larger pocket. So what we want is build one South Africa. We don't ever want to find ourselves in a position where we're dominated. Um, by one particular funder and at this point we're not and what we want is for South Africans to know that they're contributing their voice and they're contributing to this work they're doing because they believe in it and I think as South Africans it's time if we say that we're an organization that is by the people that is that is actually the people then people need to be able to fund that people need to be able to fund the work that's happening and fund us getting into government so we we emphasize that and i emphasize that today to that to say that it takes a lot of money but you can absolutely get south africans no matter how little but if you have numbers and if you have crowd you can get south africans, africans to contribute as much as any one single individual does and maybe in other in the, in the other parties and we want the voice of south africans and the contribution of ordinary south africans to be higher than of any one individual who's a high net worth individual mr baloy 
At this stage, it is myself <coughs> and the chairperson of the party. From tomorrow, we'll be accepting uh, membership subscriptions for 20 rand per member. Uh, we've got a, a, a list of a number of people who want to transact already. So that will give us at least a steady source of income. But obviously, as we continue, we need to be able to raise funds from like-minded South Africans. And we prefer to raise funds from our area of focus and our mothers and our grandmothers because it's about getting those 20 rands times 100 times 100,000. It's really going to make a difference. And the importance for us to pursue that type of agenda is to ensure that our agenda is un, uh, uh, <clears throat> there's no external influence, exerting influence about direction, about policy, about who to partner and work with. So we've resisted such moves and it's quite important for us to keep our agency pure. I suppose the, the question then is about policy, because ultimately the funding question is not just to pry into your internal finances, but, but to try and see what direction sure. you're, you're moving in. And, and so let's, let's bring the conversation onto that. Um, maybe Ms. Klazo, I'll start with you. It seems to me that the policy offering is quite similar between the three parties. Uh, Ubuntu seems to be a key value of at least two. Uh, there's a lot of talk of integrity. There's an acknowledgement that redress and economic justice is important within the context of a market economy. So I ask once again, what is the difference between the new parties and how do you distinguish yourself from Chiluba and Rise Mzansi from a policy perspective? So I want to first start by telling you the process that we took to get to our policy. So we've been going around the country and listening to South Africans, you know, um, and talking to them about various aspects of policy. We wanted to know what South Africans want to see, what are South African struggles and what matters to them. So it's been a very, for us, um, collaborative effort uh, with our constituencies. It's been a very consultative process and that's how we've come up with it. It has been values driven, as you say, at the center of it has been Ubuntu. And, you know, having spoken to South Africans, what we realize is that actually, when you speak to a South African, ideology isn't foremost. You know, uh, what South Africans care about is pragmatism. They want to know, are you actually going to change things um, for my life? Are you going to change how things are? So we've adopted um, radical centrism because radical, because we want to change things and things have to change. And it's centrist because it takes from left, it takes from right, and it brings in pragmatism and, how is it um, and practicality from, into, into what we're doing. How is it different from what's offered by other parties? Because many parties would be in the center many parties would uh, agree with a lot of the values you've espoused. So, like I've said to you, it's very practical and pragmatic, and we've come up with very specific outputs in terms of our policy. So our policy is not, um, we, we don't have an abstract kind of policy that says, uh, w for instance, we would want to um, uh, uh, see, see changes in, 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 in the economic space in a broad kind of sense. We've been very specific, for instance, to say in economy, we want to focus on the township economy, and, that, and that's a priority for us, and there's some reasons for that because we are very clear that in terms of where we sit right now with unemployment levels, um, really, really, the private sector is not able to absorb um, um, the unemployment rates in this country, but also because we want to look at the social issues that affect South Africans. So South Africans must be able to work where they live and that type of thing. So we've been quite practical already. You know, it hasn't just been a position to say because we are left or because we are right. This is We've been pragmatic and we've looked and already offered solutions that South Africans can say, oh, okay, education, school voucher system, sure. And I think that's the, the main difference between the policies. Mr. Baloy, Chiluba hasn't really actually given us a policy platform. And I wonder if that's the right way to go. I mean, you've, you've given us a, a party, but we don't know yet what it stands for. We have a name. Yeah. Do you think you could be a bit more forthcoming with where the party actually stands on uh, policy questions? Look, I think uh, one of the things to appreciate with us being here is the ingenuity and innovativeness of young people. So when we met with our team, the advice was announce the name only and then start from there building the infrastructure. And alone from announcing the name and the values of the party, we've, we've unlocked spaces like this. Already we're invited to a moon-packed thing. 
just by announcing the name, <laughs> which shows you the level of interest and excitement in our targeted area. So uh, you're not you're not going so to the moon anytime soon. I that, that thing they must wait. We'll only talk to those people or anybody after elections. So <laughs> so 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 for us, we're embarking on a consultative process now with millions of, of young people throughout the country, which is really giving us a sense because much of these conversations are had with people who have who ha who have access to platforms to engage and understand all of these things but the people who actually at the bottom who are the ones unemployed unemployable beneficiaries of 350 there's hardly conversation around policy issues and practical ideas of rescuing them and most importantly the role that the state must play in lifting them in that situation and doing so immediately so we're excited in fact it's going to culminate in our policy engagement in in june uh, youth month uh, and we'll announce more details so from where we stand there's an intention there's a target market now we're working towards unlocking the policy because it was important for us as a new party not to come with predetermined policy ideas because if we say we want to do something fundamentally different it must be born out the solutions must be born out of the engagements we have with our people but then how do how do people actually back chiluba if if we don't know where you stand on the key policy questions of the day isn't that a danger that you open yourself up not to be supported by people who may support your policy proposals but just don't know what they actually are yet i think there's still sufficient time before the peak of the elections to come out to south africa with our value proposition and ask, asking South Africans to have a little bit of patience with us as we embark on a process to articulate, to solicit, and to also uh, uh, engage with millions of young South Africans about the state of, of, the, of the country and our response there to which informed the policy. So the policy can't be informed by Bongani and his marketing team alone. We really need to embark on a rigorous journey within a short period of time to unlock the conversation of young people as that's going to happen in June. So I think for us, we still have a sufficient amount of time, but it's demonstrative by us that we followed a different route and the fact that there's so much uh, excitement and engagement of people who want to participate in the cause is reflective that people for a change see something fundamentally different where they can still add value and input uh, significantly before any substantive core ideas are formed and presented as, as an alternative right mr zibi i would say rise and Zanzi actually has probably put the most policy down on paper even though you are the youngest party. Well, I say policy, but of course your documents released uh, just after your launch say, finally, these documents are intended to provide further guidance and framing to the People's Manifesto process, a similar consultative process, but are therefore not to be construed as a manifesto containing technical solutions. So I guess a similar question to you. On the one hand, you've launched and people are interested, but on the other hand, things are still quite vague when it comes to where you actually stand on specific policies. Is that a fair assessment? No, actually, it's, uh, it's not vagueness. Uh, there is a deliberate attempt on our part to build a people's manifesto. So a couple of things. First, we want to change the political culture in South Africa. What does a political culture say? It says people like us here have got the solutions that we must go and sell to the people. The people know what their problems are. They know what solutions would work in their own communities. Part of the reason 70% of people do not turn up at the ballot is because of this way of building manifestos, which is we're simply going to present it to you, tell you what your problems are and so on. So what we have done is to make an ideological declaration, as you would have seen, we've chosen the social democratic option, which is a center left option, because it provides the best interpretation of the values of our constitution, We've stated that we believe in Chapter 2, the Bill of Rights of our Constitution and so on. So that sets the frame of how we're going to develop this. When you have an open and public process of building a People's Manifesto, it talks to that earlier question you asked about funders and how much say they have, because people will be able to participate in this process. And when that manifesto is finished, they can see some of their fingerprints on it, things they said in a town hall meeting and that sort of thing. And at that point, I would like to challenge anybody who then says, who, who pays the piper, plays the tune, or however the saying goes, to say, we've gone on this process. We've involved hundreds and thousands of people in this process over a four-month period. You've heard what they've said. This is the outcome of that process. Are you happy that we've done it in a transparent way? Because we think in that way, people are more likely to mobilize for that political idea. Right now, we have a politics of personality, enclosed party politics, where if you're not a member, you cannot have a say. We 
not going to have branches which are closed and people cannot participate. Any South African can come in and make a contribution. Thank you. I think we're going to continue with this conversation and dive a little bit deeper into some of the policy questions that have been raised on uh, these different parties and the way that they've presented themselves publicly. So stay tuned to see where these parties stand on a few more issues as we dive deeper on this conversation. See you after the break. Welcome back to Unfiltered. We're discussing new political entrants on South Africa's burgeoning political landscape. And we were just having a conversation about policy. And I just want to dive a bit deeper into some of the statements that have already been made by your respective parties. And Mr. Zibi, you have come out squarely supporting the constitutional framework, the Bill of Rights. Of course, this is still early. You're going to a deeper uh, policy engagement with, with people. But some have criticized the constitution of late for actually not fulfilling the hopes and aspirations of South Africa, said it's actually too moderate for the massive challenges facing South Africa. You have been a strong advocate and rise in Zansi for re-establishing our constitution and living up to its, its values. Why do you think that the constitution is still fit for purpose? So uh, this is what I was very specific to say chapter two of the constitution well, that's what because the values are. those are the and, values and of the, the constitution and, and so chapter one the the part of the public discourse is the idea that constitutions cannot be changed right firstly which is not true our constitution mm -hmm. has been amended 16 times it provides instruments for its own amendment and to the extent that we need to amend parts of the constitution it's important that we do that what i think we must not tinker with is chapter two because you open a door that we cannot close with a death penalty, with LGBTIQ rights and so on. We really must not go there as a country. So that is the first thing. The second thing, I think it is important to disabuse of the lie that is brought into the discourse by executive minded people who say the reason we have failed to do all of these things is because the constitution does not empower us enough as the executive to take arbitrary decisions. The problem with that kind of approach is that you might think it's going to be used against certain powerful interests, but that weapon works as effectively against the weak. What we have not done in South Africa is to live up to, the, to what our constitution asks us to do. We recently had a thing about, uh, about land, that the constitution is preventing us from doing that. Since I worked for a mining company for seven years, mining companies together with the Department of Minerals remove communities all the time. The, that land gets expropriated. We have the how train. It was built where people's homes where that land was expropriated for a public purpose. It really is a lie to suggest then that under the same constitution where we move people for a train, you cannot move expropriate land to settle people that deserve it. We simply as a people or a government has chosen not to do it for that specific purpose. So that is why we are reluctant to follow this uh, bandwagon of saying the whole constitution must be taft out, give the executive more powers, because that has got harmful effects. We must do what the constitution tells us to do. And having said that, uh, you also speak about the importance of judicial reform, yes. which, which is something I haven't heard much before from political parties. But I wondered about this, where you say, Quote, the depth of the technical knowledge needed to adjudicate overly increasingly complex cases by the bench remains suspect. Yeah. Is that not quite a broad statement impugning the bench, the, the judiciary no, 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 itself? No, 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 not at all, Caesar. I think, I mean, one of, the, I tend to follow the, the, the proceedings at the, at the JSC quite, uh, quite, quite, quite keenly. I just have a thing for it. We have tax laws in South Africa, we've got competition law, we've got trade law and that sort of thing. It is important that the bench is able to attract people with enormous expertise across all of those areas to sit on the bench. I must tell you with the deepest of respect, that depth on the bench is lacking. That's one of the reasons you sometimes have cases that go on appeal unnecessarily to the Constitutional Court because the lower courts, the High Court and the Supreme Court of Appeal do not have the depth they need right. in order to adjudicate fairly because litigation costs money. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. 
let's let's go into some of the statements. Chiluba is still embarking on its policy direction, but you've come out and said you think redress does matter, but also it needs to be implemented better, etc. Can you flesh that out a bit for us and how that proposition would look different to what already exists? Because in many ways, that's what the ANC says, maybe not what it does, but that's what it, it says. Yeah, look, we firmly believe that redress is important. <clears throat> and uh, almost 30 years into democracy, we don't believe that the application of redress has yielded the type of result that we should be bearing today as a consequence of the manifested corruption within that and some of the challenges within the redress. But we must actually expand the redress. You know, many people limit redress to only economic question, but we don't actually link redress to infrastructure at the grassroots that give access to and standardize and normalize infrastructure that allows people to live decent lives. So from our perspective, we actually expand the redress and in its entire value chain from your redress of providing of infrastructure, economic participation, economic inclusion as well, but equally, how do we support those who are previously disadvantaged? I think that's still a very important part. And I think the state has actually not fulfilled its obligation in lifting, in fact, in including people into spaces and increasing the access to, to the most in the economy. I think what, what has happened, you've seen those who are close to politicians benefit more in dodgy deals, but not really all in sundry have got the capacity and wherewithal, but need some level of support from government to be able to access that. So redress is fundamentally important to us. So Ms. Sazo, I'm gonna come back to you after the break because I have a question to ask about an interesting proposal you've made for a basic income grant. So we'll come back on that question after the break as we dive deeper into the offering of new parties on South Africa's political spectrum. Welcome back to Unfiltered. We're having a fascinating conversation, debate about the new entrance in South African politics. And before we continue our conversation, we're going to look at some of the things you've been saying on Twitter. So let's see what Chingana says. True, Bongani Baloy, former DA, Songezo Zibi is working with Makashule Ghana, former DA. Nobuntu is Webster working with Musi Maimane, former DA. These black former DA members are pretending as if they left unceremoniously where they've been unleashed to divide black vote. Kenna says, no, just taking advantage of ANC confused voters who are clearly expecting to give their votes to anyone who can lie to them. They are gullible and inept, remember. And Mzuvugile says, I think it is good for democracy because there are more choices for people to vote for. But I would like to see every position in those parties being challenged. Even those leaders who are behind the formation of parties must be challenged. This is not a private business, in course. So we've also done a, a poll on Twitter and let's have a look at this. So the poll question, is does the mushrooming of new political parties enhance SA's constitutional democracy? And hmm, no, 79, yes, 21. So 167 votes, interesting response to our poll. Coming back to our conversation, um, we've been talking about the different offerings, Rise Mzansi on the constitution, Chiluba on a new form of redress, Bosa, came out swinging when invited to the Moonshot Pact and with its feet firmly on earth said, we will join, but there are a couple of policy things we think need to be in place first. And I was quite interested to, say, uh, to see that you said some kind of basic income grant is necessary for South Africa. That's quite a big statement. Some say we can't afford it with the state, the parlous state of our finances. Why do you think that South Africa could do with a, a whole basic income grant right now? You know, um, we often talk about equality and the fact that South Africans have access to opportunity, but we rarely ever talk about equity. So I can have access to an opportunity, but do I have uh, the ability to be able to access that opportunity. And so you can't talk about creating work because in our 10 point plan, yes, that's one of, that's one of the points, but we've also got a, a, a entrepreneurship um, and focus on entrepreneurship uh, and in developing, especially the township economy as part of our plan. We've also got 
putting a job in every home as part of our plan. But the point is that you need to have equity and you need to have people enabled to be able to start a business, for instance, if you're a young person and you want to start a business. You have to be enabled as a young person to be able to go and look for a job. And that takes money. And so as it stands now, with more than 60% of South Africa's young people unemployed, according to the ex expanded definition, there are many people who are unable to access opportunity that you might come as, as, as a new government and present and create for them, but you have to, be make, to make sure that you're able to enable and empower them to be able to access the opportunity. I think that you, you, you have to be able to balance the idea that the, 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 there's opportunity and the idea that people are now able to have agency to be able to make things happen for themselves. Do you think, we have, do you think we have the money, though? Uh, because I, I think many would agree with that, but the, the worry is we go too far fiscally and then find ourselves in a, in a debt crisis. You look at the corruption levels in this country and how much we're losing from the corruption that's happening in this country. And you know that all it's about is about the efficient use of budgets and the repurposing of budget that currently exists in this country. So there is, if we're able to lose the billions that we're able to lose to corruption, we definitely are enabled to empower young people especially to be able to work and to be able to create work. Can we come to 2024 and coalitions? Because of course we have an election, it's, it's actually approaching very quickly. And I suppose, one of the difficulties looking at what's happened in municipalities with new entrants is interesting new proposition, you put it to voters and then you get the cards dealt to you and then you have to play a, a, game, of, a game of coalition chess. Mm -hmm. Have you thought about how you can avoid being influenced by existing players avoid being put into difficult positions where you have to sacrifice your values. Have, have you been learning anything from the way municipalities have, have been in this chronic state of, of instability? Uh, Mr. Zibi, let, let me start with you. So I think the one thing that this whole mess has shown is how broken the political system is in itself. South Africa is the only country in the world that at least I know of where it is possible for one person to potentially be mayor of two different cities in one term because of the closed door deal making that happens where people end up in office. There's something fundamentally wrong with that. Now, one of the unfortunate things is that in order to change this system and in our policy documents, as we have seen, we are proposing sweeping changes to the political system, to government and, and so on and the levels of transparency so that we do not have the circus anymore. But I think one of the things we have to navigate is this endemic culture of secretive deal making. That particularly excludes civil society who have to deal with the fallout of the dysfunction that we're seeing in the metros and so on. And that's one of the reasons, even in the context of this moonshot coalition discussion, we've said we accept the, the reality of coalitions, but can we please consider that in the entire political space, there are non-party political actors who have a stake in what should happen to the country in future. And I think that will reduce the cynicism. We are committed to that process of broader inclusivity. Absolutely. Um, Ms. Lazo, thoughts on the moonshot pact proposal and the wider chess game that is going to inevitably happen after 2024 and how you avoid some of the pitfalls we've seen in municipalities recently? So we've made it very clear um, in our response to our own invitation to the moon, um, moon, moon shot pet. <laughs> moon, moon, moon shot pet. <laughs> Um, where we stand and <coughs> some of the criteria, I mean, some of that for us is that we, the values have to align. Um, decision making has to be equitable around the table. Uh, we have to be able to stand and say, this is, our, this is our plan and this is what we're doing. How does it align with yours and how do we work together? One of the other things is that before we get into agreements, there's opportunity to work together already. So, for instance, we had the ESCOM court action uh, with which we worked with a number of, of political parties uh, that already exist. And those are opportunities to test um, the partnerships and to test, you know, test the muscle uh, of the potential coalition. And there's opportunity to do that as well. But we've been quite clear uh, in terms of what is important and what the criteria uh, that we have in order to be able to work together in a coalition. But having said that, most important for us is that we are constituency driven. 
So we always have to go back to our constituencies and say, here is, here is what is happening and hear from them what they're saying and what they want to happen. Maloy, um, are you going to be swallowed by the DA or because there is a serious danger that an op the biggest opposition announces this pact and expects everyone to come in. Um, how do you think you're going to navigate this, these murky waters of coalitions which you've already been involved in to some extent in your previous life? Look, we're quite clear. We, we declined the offer to be part of this conversation. We believe that it's too premature and we believe that it does not make any logical sense for parties which are facing an expiring term to pull people together to have a conversation around a coalition for which we must still go and contest elections. And some of the challenges are practic is practical in nature because if we come together, <coughs> sorry, as six parties, we'll still appear as six parties in the ballot paper. So all we'll tell voters is that if you don't like Songhezo, you can vote for me, but we'll still collaborate. So actually people who want to vote for Songhezo can just vote for uh, Songhezo and vote for Shiluba and vice versa. So for those reasons, we felt that uh, coalitions will be a fact of reality post-2024 elections and will only engage in that possibility after the elections. Between now and then, we'll not be engaging with any political party. We're a new party. We need to work and dedicate our effort and time towards building Shilova and ensuring that we are geared to fight and contest elections across the country. That's our only focus. Any other conversation we will not entertain, will not be part of. And even if there's donors who are uh, appetizing and putting a carrot on the... I mean, uh, uh, incentive on the table will not uh, uh, entertain such a thing. We understand what we stand for and we know how important it is for us to represent our constituents adequately and to ensure that by the time we get to the table, when the time comes, we would have uh, mobilized, coordinated and, go and, 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 and actually solidified the vote from our constituents to be able to represent this youth, this youth voice that is missing in all of this. Well, Mr. Baloy, Ms. Lazo, Mr. Zibi, just to thank you very much for being prepared to field the tough questions. Uh, it's wonderful to have new entrants being prepared to respond. So thank you so much for your time and for joining us on Unfiltered. We learned some very interesting things this evening in our conversation about the new entrants that are blazing across South Africa's political landscape. We learned what they think about key questions like the constitution, redress, a basic income grant, we learned how they will negotiate at the negotiating table, and we also heard what makes them different. The question for you is, is more choice better, or is this simply confusing? We'll find out as the road to 2024 unfolds, and look forward to joining you on that road here on Unfiltered. See you on the next installment, and good evening.